So hi everyone and welcome to today's lunchtime lecture as part of the Stories About Sustainability series this autumn. Um, the series invites architects from around the world to look back to the materiality and craft of the past and see how it can inform more sustainable building practices now and in the future. Uh, I'm Anija Verghese, I'm the Head of Public Engagement here at the AA, and I'm delighted to introduce today's speakers, who are architects and educators, Matthew Barnett Howland and Oliver Wilton, whose project for the temporary reuse of granite from Baselgate River Wall at Victoria Embankment um, at a series of locations in the City of London is titled From the Thames to Eternity. Today, they'll present this project to question the conventional understanding of components as subsidiary to buildings and discuss how this sits within the, their broader interests in resource systems and in architecture life cycles. Um, their presentation will be followed by a conversation with Juliet Haysom, who frequently works with Stone in her own creative practice, as well as through her teaching in, the, in media studies at the AA. And together, they'll consider how the reuse of Stone can change our approach to how we build. Uh, before I hand over to Matthew and Oliver, a few logistics. Um, following their talk and Juliet's response, we'll open up the conversation for a wider discussion. So please feel free to post your questions in the chat at any point throughout the talk. And then we can either ask it on your behalf um, when, the, when the conversation opens up or else um, if you use the raise hand function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, we can um, unmute you to ask it yourself. Um, also, since we decided to hold this series online in the name of sustainability, as well as to enable global participation, if you feel comfortable to do so, please turn your camera on, um, especially during the discussion, so we can all feel as though we're in the same space. So for now, I'll hand over to Matthew and Oliver, and please join me in welcoming both of them and Juliet um, to this lecture at, at the virtual AA. <laughs> over to you. Hi. I'm Matthew Barnett Howland. I'm director of research and development at CSK Architects in Eton and an associate professor here at Bartlett um, with Oliver. I'm going to do the second half of the talk. So I'm going to hand over to Oliver and Juliet. Do you want to introduce yourself as well, briefly? Yeah, I'm Juliet Haysom and I'm an artist and I teach at the AA, but also um, just to say, Matt, I think there is a bit of an echo, perhaps if both of you have your mics one, one or other muted, um, it might not. I think it's being maybe picked up through. No, it's okay. We're, we're, I'm, I'm signing off now in a way. Don't worry. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So yeah, I'm Oliver Wilson. I'm a. I'm a. You need to turn that sound off. Sorry. I'm. I'm Oliver Wilson. I'm a. I'm a academic at the Bartler and also an architect in practice, a director at WW Studio, and uh, we going to be talking about uh, today we're going to be talking about material provenance and architecture and discussing some uh, some related projects this is the structure of our talk so we're going to start with the conceptualization and then discuss a number of projects where we we've developed our thinking in, in roughly chronological order so provenance uh, relates to the fact of coming from a particular source or quarter and the terms often used with reference to a work of art or an antique, in part to establish its history, authenticity, cultural value and related financial value. It's also used quite often in relation to food and wine these days in a slightly broader sense. In architecture, the artifact in question would typically be the building, uh, at least from the architect's perspective. In his 1929 painting, The Treachery of Images, René Magritte, addresses a conceptualization of the artifacts and points out that this isn't a pipe, but rather the image of a pipe. Uh, in, in Magritte's view, everything we see hides another thing. And for us, this is an important point in relation to architecture provenance, where we'd argue that it's important to see a building in two ways at once, both as a built, built and inhabited artifact and also as a continuum, a coalescence of parts that changes over time. This is Exeter Cathedral. Its origins date back to 1050 and construction started on the current decorated Gothic cathedral in the late 13th century. And the ornate screen uh, to the west front that you can see here was constructed mostly in the 15th century. It is very much a building and quite a remarkable one. And at the same time, it's not so much building as a shifting continuum or temporal condition, 
coalescence of parts and matter that have come together from diverse origins for a period of time before continuing on their journey. The current West Front consists of a range of stones assembled over a period of most of the last millennium, starting in the 14th century. And including an, a number of stone types from different origins, such as limestone from beer, sandstone from, sandstone from saddlecomb, and also some volcanic stone. Here's our architecture life cycle diagram in circular form, uh, and it illustrates this duality. During the lifespan of a work of architecture, resources are extracted and gathered, formed into parts, and, and assemble typically, typically into a building. And this is then inhabited and maintained, modified, and so on. And eventually there generally comes a, a time when the building falls out of use and is demolished or disassembled. Now it's, it's only during this stage that the building exists as a coalescence of parts. And the rest of the time, these materials and parts are on their journey from their origins to, to wherever. Now, the term building life cycle uses as a biological analogy. In biology, life cycle encompasses the lifespan of an organism and it includes reproduction, hence the term life cycle. Often when people talk about architecture life cycle, they're actually talking about lifespan. And it's this stage in orange, the cycling and reuse stage that goes from the end of one architecture lifespan to the start of the next. Um, that can turn lifespan into life cycle. Now, it's worth noting that it's not the architecture that cycles, but rather it's the component parts and materials. So architecture life cycles created by architecture parts and materials contributing um, to several architecture lifespans over their own lifespan. Now, this has implications for how we, we might wish to conceive of architecture as we aim to move towards more environmentally sustainable modes of practice. And it brings into question the common perception of components as subsidiary to architecture and points to the relativity in these relationships that might actually uh, be desirable to foreground moving forward. Now, distinct from the worlds of art and antiquities, for us, provenance does not only relate to past pathways, but rather to past and future pathways. And in our view, an important part of the role of the architect is to help maintain the potentiality of building parts and not to unnecessarily curtail the potential for building parts in architecture projects to go on to contribute to other as yet undetermined projects in the future. So in other words, we try to design in order to help ensure that when the building reaches the end of its life, the component parts do not and that destructive demolition is avoided. So this photos the demolition of Glencarn Tower Motherwell in 2011. So the role of the architect in enabling architecture life cycle is to an extent to design for reuse, for, for to design for reuse, and then to design with reuse. Uh, here's the modular architecture life cycle structure used in BS 15978 and widely referenced by Reba and others. It runs from stage A, product construction process, through stage B, use, and building stage, to stage C, end of life. Stage D is a separate module. It considers benefits and loads beyond the system boundary and addresses reuse, recovery, and recycling potential. This is the stage that, that enables lifespan to become life cycle. Uh, with building parts and materials passing from one lifespan to the next, this makes intuitive sense to us and opens up new architecture opportunities. So zooming in for a minute, there's another sense in which a building is not a single artifact or entity. In the 1990s, Frank Duffy developed the notion of shearing layers, by which he meant that buildings are large and complex assemblies of constructional layers that evolve over different timescales. This means that at the point where parts and materials are coalesced into a building, there's a kind of dynamic equilibrium that keeps it together, with different families and components operating 
different lifespans in response to their own particular sets of environmental and inhabitational dynamics. Duffy said, our basic argument is that there isn't any such thing as a building. And a building properly conceived is several layers of longevity of, of built components. Going back to providence, distinction sometimes drawn between the origin and the provenance of an article. This is helpful for architecture, and we draw a distinction between the origin of an artifact and its subsequent provenance or chain of custody. The what's, where's, how's, and why's of the artifact on its journey. Here's our preliminary resource system diagram, which is a work in progress. Architectural life cycle sits in the center where it interacts with the five geochemical spheres. The lithosphere, pedosphere or ground sphere and biosphere have direct flows and returns to architecture. The hydrosphere and atmosphere encompass all of this and interact with everything. So the reason we produce this diagram is to try to give a simpler way to explain some aspects of our projects. And in relation to architecture provenance, Generally, most of the time, origin is the orange donut encompassing the five geochemical spheres. And provenance is the pink circle in the middle that encompasses architecture life cycle. So Cork House is a project that we've talked a lot about. And today we're going to focus on material provenance and how it's influenced the design. Project draws from the biosphere and addresses architecture life cycle and design for reuse. It's where we started to develop our approach and uh, an approach that we call form follows life cycle. Cork is one context for the project and another is complexity in contemporary forms of construction. Where once a building, a brick building uh, would have had a brick structure and envelope, Today, what we might call a brick building could well consist of a complex arrangement of many different materials, building products and specialist subsystems. These configurations have been developed in a piecemeal fashion over time, often with the aim of giving a low cost way to meet shifts in building performance requirements. In some cases, as a new requirement is introduced, so another building component is added. This builds in complexity at each stage of the architecture life cycle. And this is particularly evident at the end of the building life in cases of destructive demolition, where the building is simply too complex and costly to disassemble into constituent parts at the end of its life. In this context, the basic hypothesis, hypothesis for Cork House was that we could replace the current complex layered model of construction on the left with the solid Cork building envelope on the right in a way that would still fully meet current building performance requirements. So regarding origin, cork oak landscapes have existed around the Mediterranean basin for millennia, and some areas um, have been subject to environmental protection laws for, for several hundred years. Cork oaks typically grow in areas with low rainfall where they help to stabilize the hydrology, which helps to support local ecosystems and prevent desertification. They're currently mainly distributed in Portugal, Spain, and North Africa. The management of the cork forest is often combined with arable and livestock farming in a way that also helps to support a biodiverse ecosystem. This includes the black Iberian pigs who graze on acorns in the shade and are used to create patanegra ham, and also wild inhabitants such as the Eurasian crane, Iberian lynx, and Iberian eagle. These landscapes are also rich in human culture and history. Cork is the elder bark of the cork oak tree. It's harvested around every nine years using hand tools in a process that does not harm the tree. The material used for the project is called pure agglomerated expanded cork, and it's made with granules of secondary cork from forestry management. There's a reciprocal relationship between cork house and the cork oak landscapes in a very straightforward way because the landscape provided the cork and the purchase the purchase of the cork has provided some funds to help manage and maintain these landscapes here's the cooking process in action one of the cork blocks 
So the gorse clove on the right is cooking cork granules with superheated steam. And here you can see emerging the freshly, freshly cooked cork blocks. This low grade granulated cork is placed in autoclaves and the granules are steam cooked at over 300 degrees Celsius. Over 90% of the heat coming from waste biomass. This causes the cork to expand and the natural resin in the cork called subrin to melt and then rebond these granules together without the use of any additional ingredients. So what you end up with is uh, a block of pure expanded uh, plant-based cork with no added ingredients. Using the billets of expanded cork as our starting point, we set out to develop a simple prefabricated construction kit that's assembled by hand on site, something a bit like giant plant-based Lego. Using half a metre thick blocks that interlock using a tongue and groove fit with no glue or mortar. Now this allows for easy assembly and simple disassembly at the end of building life. And um, here's an initial prototype. Now, as the design developed, it became clear that although it's simple in principle asking one material to perform all of the functions of the building envelope. It was resulting in some relatively complicated geometries. And this was especially true of the cobbled roof blocks that you can see on the right. And this presented a problem when using traditional machine tools, both in terms of the amount of time it took to, to make each block, and also in terms of achieving the level of precision necessary um, to, to enable a snug dry jointed interference fit. So we were lucky to have access to the Bartlett's robotics facilities and expertise, which enabled us to move from traditional workshop methods to develop a digital fabrication method using an industrial robot for the research purposes. And this approach was then used as the basis for the five axis milling of all of the blocks for the cork house on the right by Wap Doodle. Here's the first successful section of wool produced using the robotic milling. So this cross section of cork house shows that the sim shows the simple constructional model, and it, you could say that it's deliberately primitive. Uh, literally one thing stacked on top of another, corking compression, and the CLT wardrobe at the centre and timber eaves beam seen here in elevation um, resist, la resist lateral wind loading. So here's the full cork construction kit that we used for cork house. It's a prefabricated kit of parts that can be assembled on site almost entirely by hand. Starting at the bottom, you have uh, removable steel screw pie foundations, then timber ring beam and CLT floor slabs, cork wall blocks in compression, a timber beam system at eaves level that connects to the CLT wardrobes and addresses lateral and shear loads, cork roof blocks in uh, compression, and then timber frames and steel roof lights on top of each pyramid that act like big paperweights. Each part of the each part of the assembly uses mechanical interconnections, tongue and groove connections between cork blocks, and also for some timber parts, um, screws or bolts elsewhere, and, and there's no glue or cement used. So this means that it should hopefully be as easy to disassemble as it was to assemble in the first place. Here's the construction sequence in brief. Steel screw piles support timber ring beam. CLT floor slabs uh, with cork insulation underneath rest on the timber ring beam. The cork blocks are simply uh, slotted one on top of another. The house was built by Matthew and here's me on site putting in a rare day's work, which was a lot of fun. Um, lateral loading is taken by the end walls and these structural CLT wardrobes. The eaves, the eaves beam um, locks the cork walls together and uh, it itself is locked together using bolted connections and steel plates at the corners. Here's a double female block on the cobbled roof being slotted into place. And steel frame roof lights sit on top of the cobbled roof pyramids, no glue or mortar used, acting like giant paperweights. Windows and doors are, are, are screwed back to timber subframes in the cork walls. <clears throat> Sorry, there's no, there are no internal wall finishes and there's no routine maintenance needed over the building lifespan internally. 
surfaces are exposed or run in a single conduit in the floor and then in risers up in the CLT wardrobes. So this gives easy access for maintenance and replacement uh, with the aim being to enable the various layers of the building to do what they need within their own specific time frames. Uh, sacrificial oak floorboards are screwed down to the CLT slabs. Externally, there's also no finish and no routine maintenance anticipated. At the rear, um, there's some fire treated weatherboarding, which is simply battened off of the cork, and this was needed to meet um, building requirements, building regulations. Uh, the roof has cedar weatherboarding um, uh, screwed to the inclined faces uh, to stop the rain from trickling through on those faces. Copper rain water goods are used outside and brass sheet is used inside um, in wet areas. And these are both untreated, so that they should be easy to recycle and they're anticipated to, to last for the life of the building. Um, here are some footings to steps and, uh, and also some steps made out of Purbeck stone outside. So as mentioned, the cork block system can be taken apart as easily as it is being put together. This is something that we tested and demonstrated with a prototype cork cabin that was assembled at UCL to make sure it fitted together before being taken apart and transported to site for reassembly. Returning briefly to the modular life cycle structure. So we can understand stages A, B and C in this way. So plant-based material from a biodiverse landscape um, processed using uh, biomass, carefully shaped uh, into parts to allow for a dry assembly, giving a distinctive architectural character and should also be easy to disassemble at the end of life. And the design for disassembly gives these potentials for stage D. So reuse of the building parts, recycling of the cork, for example, as looseful insulation, or simply returning it to the biosphere. And at the point where the cork does eventually return to the biosphere, as it's a biorenewable material, it will nourish new growth and go on to contribute to new origins. Over to Matthew. Hi everyone. So this is a uh, sorry, this is a project that, that we're working on with the City of London uh, at the moment. Um, it's called From the Thames to Eternity. Um, as a city built on clay and gravel, London has no native stones. So stone has always been a precious architectural commodity with stones flowing into the capital for continuous use and reuse in successive generations of stone architecture. London Roman Wall was one of the largest construction projects in Roman Britain and construction started around the year 200. The original wall was about two and a half miles long and used in the region of 85,000 tonnes of Kentish ragstone. Nearly a thousand years later, after winning the Battle of Hastings in 1066, William the Conqueror started building the White Tower in 1087. It was made with stones, including Kentish ragstone and imported con stone from France for facing details, and then largely refaced with Porton stone in the 18th century. And this is the Bank of England, a more recent example. This is John Soane's two and a half metre thick Portland stone faced curtain wall built in the 18th and early 19th century and heavily modified since then. This is one of the starting points for this project. The Victoria Embankment was constructed under the direction of Joseph Bazalgette and completed in 1870. It formed part of a grand project to create an intersecting sewer for London in order to prevent raw sewage from flowing into the Thames. The project was commissioned following the Great Stink of 1858. At Victoria Embankment, this involved significant land reclamation, which is shown here in orange, which moved the existing riverbank much further out into the Thames. 
and as such this required the construction of a new granite river wall to retain this new section of land. Victoria Embankment also incorporates a part of what is now the district line and other urban infrastructure. This contemporaneous section shows the granite blocks that form the embankment wall sourced from several UK quarries. Some of these granite blocks have recently been removed from the wall as part of the Thames Tideway Tunnel, uh, a, a circa four billion pound project that will increase the capacity of the London sewage system. This will reduce the amount of raw sewage that flows into the Thames during periods of heavy rainfall. The granite blocks are being removed from this site to enable construction of one of the interception chambers that link the old and new sewers. The granite blocks, about over 500 in total, were carefully removed from the embankment wall and stored in Gravesend, awaiting their next use. The blocks are fairly large, most being 500 by 600 by 900 mil or larger, uh, and are roughly around one tonne each. In this form, they have a potential lifespan of several thousand years and could contribute to many dozens of buildings and structures over this period, starting with in Victoria Embankment. So breaking the blocks down into smaller ones or into aggregate might make it easier to find the next use for them, but it would disregard their cultural heritage value and also limit the range of subsequent uses. So our aim for this project was to work with the blocks in the current shapes and sizes as much as possible, which can be seen as keeping the door open to tens or hundreds of future uses. This work can be seen as a particular type of circular economy case study that also links into broader lithosphere resource systems. So back to the diagram Oliver showed earlier, the stones came from the lithosphere and have been in play in the built environment for around 150 years. And our aim here is to help keep them in play and not to reduce their potentiality. In a sense, this is similar to the interesting status of building stones at several historic sites across the world. This is at Delphi, where the distinction between what is a building and what is a building component is blurred. And similarly here in Java, where there is a sense that both the building and the building stones are in a constant state of transformation with each other. Uh, this was a, a playful exercise where we made a 1 to 20 scale model of the granite blocks um, using uh, cork, what else, uh, which we used to explore the potential configurations for the blocks in their future uses. We've identified a series of sites that form a north-south route between the Millennium Bridge and Smithfield Market, running via St Paul's Cathedral. And this is us uh, in the city taking some direct action, as it were, working with one-to-one -one templates of the blocks, identifying suitable locations with a particular resonance and figuring out, figuring out specific configurations for each of those sites. The stones will be installed uh, both as an urban intervention to be used by the public for somewhere to rest or talk or have a bite to eat, etc., but also as a form of stone storage, as, as per the sites at Delphi and elsewhere we just looked at. As part of this project, we are collaborating with geologist and UCL colleague Ruth Siddle, who is working to identify the origins of the granite stones. This is Ruth in action during a visit uh, to see the stones in their current storage location on a farm near Basildon a couple of weeks ago. The process of identifying the granites starts with trying to find a relatively clean, unweathered face and having a closer look. And here are some of the preliminary findings. Block number 43 is a grey granite, rich in aluminium with lots of white mica. It is perhaps from St Austell or Godolphin in Cornwall. And block number 23 is rose and white with quite a lot of black mica, and it's possibly from Clinturty in Aberdeenshire. Block number five is a grey granite containing big chunks of glimmering muscovite. It is perhaps from St. Austell also.
These granite blocks are architecture components that can punch through space and time, and they are somewhat immutable and give a clear sense of relativity between architecture and component. And as discussed, they might last for, say, 10,000 years and contribute to 100 buildings over their lifespan. So Phoenix House is a live project for a new house in Berkshire. The client is Andrew Try, and the design has been developed with the practice I work for, CSK Architects. And as you'll see shortly, there's also a significant element of research and development that has been undertaken as a collaboration with the Bartlett UCL. The site is an estate on the top of St. Leonard's Hill on the edge of Windsor, with panoramic, panoramic views of the surrounding landscape and Windsor Castle here you can see to the east. The site has been occupied for several centuries, but the first documented house was built in around 1780 by Lady Waldegrave, with a large part of it designed by the architect Thomas Sandby RA. And then in the 1870s, Sir Francis Barry effectively rebuilt the house as a much larger and slightly gaudy mansion in the style of a, a French chateau or gateau even. This had some rather grand classical interiors, like this oct octagonal hall at the centre of the house with solid stone columns and staircases. So Francis died in 1907, and when his wife Lady Barry died in the 1920s, their son, Sir Edward Barry, who apparently hated the house in the first place, discovered that it was also very difficult to sell. Eventually, I think it's safe to say that his emotions got the better of him, and he decided to blow up the house with dynamite which you can see on the right, and the estate was sold off into several lots. This is the ruins of the house in the 1930s. All that is left intact of the old house today is this rather beautiful stone portico, which is surrounded by some lovely building stones that would have formed part of the classical language of the original building. The site immediately around the ruin is a reconstituted landscape made of the spoils of the rest of the house, and like much of the wider site, it has effectively returned to nature. And spread all around the woodland and gardens on the estate are piles of stones which have now been lying in the ground for almost 100 years. The stones have acquired a certain character from their recent history, including broken edges and layers of dirt, and moss, lichens, and so on. And so even though it was the site of a violent act of demolition, this aging process has given the place as a whole an incredibly picturesque atmosphere. This next section briefly describes the broader architectural project for a new house on the site. We approach the design as a kind of quasi-archaeological process of creative reconstruction. So it's an exercise in reimagining the plan, as it were. This is the original footprint of the Victorian mansion, the most recent house to occupy the site. Most of this building that was demolished in the 1920s, as I said, leaving a portico intact amongst a pile of building rubble. And it's the portico that we've treated as a surviving archaeological fragment from which to regenerate a new composition. So the underlying spatial order that, of the new house is a framework of structural columns based on the rhythms of the original portico. This comprises four rows of regularly spaced north-south columns that extend the base structure of the ruin, and four rows of east-west columns that reproduce the irregular structural rhythm of the ruin. And a garden is carved out at the centre of the composition to create a courtyard house with the ruin forming the fourth side. So the plan of the new house has been regrown from this fragment of DNA of the original house. You could say it's similar to a family resemblance that resonates across several generations. You know, a bit like this is the great nephew of the Victorian house. And these are a few images of the new house to give you some context for the reuse exercise that I'm about to describe. This is looking from the portico across the courtyard garden to the new entrance colonnade at upper ground level. This is the sunken court, courtyard garden underneath the new colonnade looking back at the old portico on the right. And here you get a sense of the sort of materials and the tectonics of the project with a load bearing stone frame, brick walls and timber elements. 
And this is looking down into the old Victorian kitchen, which will now be an external courtyard in front of a new archive dedicated largely to the history of the estate. So the final part of the lecture will focus on the specific method of reuse that we developed for stage D in order to enable the transition from one life, life cycle into another. And most importantly, perhaps, how this enabled material provenance to play a key role in the architectural character of the new building. The site was excavated over the space of a few months last year. Foundations are exposed and will be reused for the new house using a reinforced concrete slab to transfer the loads between the new layout above and the plan of the Victorian foundations underneath. This process resulted in a lot of loose fill like soil, used lime, rubble, etc., that was sorted into various piles on site. And more importantly for our purposes was the recovery of many more building stones from the original mansion, as well as many thousands of bricks, roughly about one third of them whole and two thirds of them broken. Our design proposes to make the structure of the new house out of the building materials that are lying around the site, as well as those that we have been recovering during the process of, of excavation. The constructional hierarchy will match that of the original house with brick walls and arches used for the lower ground floor and stone for the trabeated frame at the upper level. For the stone, there were two types of reuse that we wanted to explore. The first is a fairly straightforward process of returning the building stones to generic components as shown here from the USA in the 1920s. Although this so-called clean cut approach erases most of their provenance as part of a previous building, it obviously doesn't alter their material origin as pieces of stone from the ground. The second method of stone reuse is intended to preserve the provenance of the reclaimed building stones, whereby the ornate character plays a role in the architectural language and the hierarchy of the new building. This is something well established in the long history of spolia, as demonstrated here by the Arch of Constantine in Rome, made of stones from several different imperial eras. So we developed a strategy of reuse for the elevations that would use mostly the clean cut method, but would deploy the more ornamental, somewhat fruitier technique of spolia to denote the entrances and openings in the building. We selected a structural bay from the north, north facade on the lower left here, that includes both types of reuse for a full scale feasibility study at one to one. This exercise was a collaboration between CSK Architects, the Bartlett, the Stone Masonry Company and Web Yates engineers. The study started with the process of extraction, collection and cleaning and numbering the stones. And then Thomas Parker from the Bartlett took a series of 3D scans on site. And then Thomas also processed the file so that we ended up with a digital model of each stone. which in turn meant we had a digital quarry of about 64 stones to work with, or an inventory of parts, if you like. From this set of building blocks, we assembled a digital model of the prototype portal for construction. And you can see that the more ornamental approach is rather fruity and is something that needs quite a lot of thought and design time. For the clean cut sections of the column and lintel, we used the best fit process that would minimize wastage. And on the right, you can see our first test. This method translated into a relatively simple relationship between each stone as a found object and each individual building component in a new building. Their final assembly as a full scale structural element also didn't require a lot of production information for the stonemason. However, the more ornamental stones required much more setting out information with, with careful thought given to where each stone was cut and how it would interface with the stone immediately above and below it. In a sense, this is an exercise at a detailed level in maintaining and expressing the provenance of the stones. Although the information was supplied uh, from a digital workflow, the stonemason cut the stones on the beam saw using a relatively analog process. 
And this is the portal as a so-called dry lay on the ground before each structural element is reinforced. And you can see from the drawing on the right that we developed quite a straightforward set of setting out principles by the end of the exercise. And this really gives you an idea of the different character extracted from the different types of reuse. And what's rather lovely about the stones that are treated like spolia is that they convey so much more history with much less cutting and wastage. In this sense, uh, there is a real economy of means to them. Both types of reuse involve the assembly of individual stones into larger building components, i.e. columns and lintels, which means that they can be assembled and disassembled as columns and beams, and therefore potentially reused in this form in other structures in the future. And these are their three structural elements being assembled at the Stone Masonry Company in Lincolnshire. And this is the final piece with the client Andrew Try talking to Pierre Bidot from the Stone Masonry Company on the left. Now, I don't think Andrew uh, was really expecting to like this sort of spolia part of this uh, structure. And on the drive up there uh, to see it, he was preparing to let us down gently, I think. Uh, but he was really taken with it when he saw it in the flesh. Uh, and, and he really appreciates the way in which it expresses both the, both the provenance of each stone, as well as the history of his site more broadly. The brick reuse started with a reasonably familiar process of slowly cleaning the lime mortar off the bricks and palletizing them. And in the meantime, samples were lab tested to check that they were suitable for structural purposes after so long in the ground back in the pedosphere. With a lot of broken bricks, we gave some thought to how this would translate into a suitable bond. And we've had a few brickwork sample panels made to see what kind of character could be developed from this process of reuse. This is a, a sort of relatively smarter version using the undamaged faces of bricks in what's known as random bond, which is based on a few simple rules that the brick that the bricky works with on site. And then it's pointed the flush line mortar. And this one is working with a much rougher character that openly expresses the nature of working with broken bricks. So the broken brick faces have been by and large turned outwards. Uh, I really like this approach, but I'm not sure that everyone else did. The project is scheduled to go on site next year, which of course is often the most challenging part of an unusual project like this. And no doubt we'll discover um, many more of the realities of reuse in the process. I'm just going to finish now with this short animation we did for the AJ where we got our crystal ball out and imagine the building in ruins again at the end of its new life cycle in a thousand years. Although I admit that's probably slightly optimistic. See global warming has also taken effect. Slightly tropical atmosphere. That's it. Thank you very much. Oh, that's great, Matt and Oliver. Thank you so much. Um, so I've got so many questions, uh, but I, I also thought um, I've been asked to put a, a couple of slides together for a project that I've worked on recently with a colleague of mine. Um, and it gives you a sense of, sort of my work and some of the teaching um, approach to teaching I've had. So is that okay if I just share my screen just to quickly show that context? Is that okay, Manager? Yeah, sure. Say. Hi, hi, great. Um, okay. Right. 
that. Okay. So um, this is a project that um, my fantastic teaching colleague, Audeline Dullier, who um, teaches in Diploma 18, um, and I were commissioned to produce uh, last year at the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, called Placeholders. And essentially, um, the VNA used to have this courtyard that was screened off, uh, that was produced in Portland Stone um, in 1909. And in 2011, uh, Amanda Levette won a competition to open up the courtyard as a new visitor entrance, which involved taking down this grade one listed screen, removing a lot of the stone and then reconstructing it with the as a series of essentially like a column, the uh, much more porous entrance way, which meant that um, I think about 450 odd stones were being removed. So this project was carried out by Pay Restoration Stonework. So on the left, you can see there um, it had these immaculate um, organized series of drawings for disassembling the Portland stone block, palletizing them all with inventory, taking them down to their warehouse in Kent, where they were stored on these beautiful storage systems in a big warehouse. Um, that was for the duration of the project. And once it was completed and the all the stones that they needed were reinstated, they then had a whole lot of spares for where the, the parts in between the columns had been removed and taken away. Um, by a weird set of coincidences and um, happenstance, um, my brother, who runs Hayson Purbeck Stone, um, ended up taking on this consignment because it falls into this strange category of it's not it's not um, part of the V&A's collection, even though it forms a historic part of the building's the, the museum's fabric. Um, so they were sort of precious in one sense that they had um, this history, but also a lot of evidence of World War II bomb damage. And yet they also couldn't pay to carry on storing them for no particular purpose. So they essentially wanted to dispose of them. And so my brother essentially took them on because, again, as Oliver and Matt mentioned, that generally the um, fate tends to be of crushing the stone down to be turned into an aggregate. But... The problem is this bottleneck of what happens next, really. So they've been sitting between 2016 and 2021 in my brother's uh, the bottom edge of his site. And you can see that in that period, the stone is fine, but the pallets are starting to uh, <laughs> deteriorate. Uh, any of the codes that were attached to the stones have sort of got lost. And none of the drawing, there weren't any drawings that came with this. It was just a consignment of random pieces of stone. So when Audeline um, was initially approached to produce a project for the VNA, um, and she asked me to collaborate with her, the first, it seemed such a brilliant opportunity to make use of this load of leftover stone and think, how can we return this to Exhibition Road um, as a temporary um, feature for landscaping purposes and really that involved a huge amount of inventory um, so we did this in a very manual way with redrawing and trying to identify all these component parts and kindly the Victorian Albert Museum gave us archival drawings later in the process but that was you know a very laborious um, initial process of trying to make sense of what we have um, and once we had a sense of these component parts, we came up with these three configurations, as well as what we thought would be a minimal amount of refinishing that was needed to put the stone back into being useful and appropriate for its context in Exhibition Road. So here they are sitting on tarmac, these chevrons, which are places that have been identified for um, longer term hostile vehicle mitigation, i.e. to stop people using a vehicle to plow into pedestrians. So this is why we called it placeholders really, is this was a temporary project until permanent feature, which were going to be um, five meter long purpose quarried Indian granite monolithic pieces coming via Italy where they were, all the masonry would be done to be installed here at massive expense. And we were trying to make the argument that, well, look, there's all this stone already available here that could do the job just as well with a little bit of an engineering upgrade. But anyway, we haven't managed, sadly, to make that case to um, the local council because the project's already in progress. Anyway, essentially, while we were working on the project, I think another thing that's interesting about this and what um, Matt was talking about is how you carry the kind of design, the, the idealized form in the computer with these heavy, very real objects that have 
from piece to piece, different qualities in this case, you know, being chipped or damaged from bombing and having patinas of weathering and so on. Um, so this sort of balance between quality and quantity um, uh, that we had to keep keep in mind. Um, here's some of the refinishing that we just sanded, some of the tool works, which actually had the lovely um, unexpected consequence of showing the original uh, 1909 coding that was all hand tooled into the stones. Um, and we really wanted to try and keep in place, again, do the absolute minimum. So once this commission had been completed and the stone returned to the quarry that um, could be reused, reused again, but we wanted to really celebrate the craftsmanship here. So Pei had two of their stonemasons came in and did a lettering inscription during the opening weekend of the festival. So it's really lovely that they were almost sort of performing their craft and could talk to people coming to visit. And so here are the, the three configurations installed uh, with the backdrop of the screen with the apertures that the stones came from. Um, so actually it was really to do with this project that I first um, got in touch with Matt and Oliver because um, Tom Parker, who um, they mentioned, who work, is doing a PhD at the Bartlett, but also teaches in media studies um, at the AA, um, Audeline and I approached him because we were really interested in this uh, relationship of inventory and component part and how 3D scanning might form a part of this. And by a lovely coincidence, Tom said, well, hang on, I'm doing a project that's exactly um, addressing these questions with Phoenix House. So it's really lovely that we've um, you know, developed this conversation uh, between our two institutions and as people with uh, interests in common. So um, that's, oh, how do I get, I get out? Let me undo my screen share. So, um, that's just to give you a little bit of anyway context of where <laughs> being asked to chair this question. So I wonder um, if I could just go back to um, like perhaps ask the first question, if I may, is I wonder, Oliver and, and Matt, um, the you met, just looking at the Phoenix House, if you could maybe talk a little bit about inventory and possibly even relating to Cork House, thinking once perhaps this imagining this future ruin and the ruin that you found, like how much a, a kind of drawing or cataloging process has, it, has informed your work or becomes a, compo com a companion to the physical artifacts of the, um, of the project? Yeah, on um, Phoenix, um, as I said, it's really a case of um, two very different um, processes in a way, depending on the type of reuse we're interested in. So um, really what we're doing is we're, the, the first distinction we're making is sort of category, separating those two categories. Um, you know, the, the stones that, we, that we're interested in working with in terms of spolia and the stones that perhaps are less, less interesting or lend themselves more readily um, to that simpler six-sided um, dimension stone um, process, you know, where, where it's literally just pushed through a saw Mm -hmm. um, like a sort of sausage, you know, and it's just cut at different lengths and they just assemble it, you know, there's no real, um, there's not very detailed information or a lot of thought to give it. Um, in terms of the um, spolio stones, I must admit that the the, the process we did with um, Thomas um, uh, was was a lot of fun, but it was also, um, which probably came across, um, it was also quite a lot of work. Um, yeah. And I think we're going to have to think quite hard about how that streamlined um really to, to to make a viable process for a for a you know traditional um building contract um because it, it was a it was quite you get a lot of heavy files and things um, and obviously it's uh, uh it's, it's using all those digital components um which you know in in hindsight yeah in that well anyway in hindsight we're, we're going to review that and see see how much we can streamline it um because mm -hmm. obviously I made the point that it's an, there's an economy of means um, in terms of the stonemason's work. Um, but in a way, what happens is some of that gets shifted um, up the chain to the um, architectural design team um, who have to spend quite a lot of time um, giving a lot of thought uh, yeah, to, to where each of those stones is cut and how it relates to the, uh, to the stone above and below it and so on. Mm. Yeah, but we haven't, um, I mean, there are a lot of um, stones on site now that, um, post excavation um uh we haven't really got to the point yet uh where we've agreed uh, how much of the how much of the project will be the six-sided 
um, clean cut stones and how much it will be will be more spolia based um so there's probably there is probably quite a lot of cataloging and and, uh, mm -hmm. and developing the industry to be done actually still yeah and i thought also it's interesting that um you mentioned that the original house had been uh blown up with explosives mm -hmm. so I, I think one of the another issue that happens quite often isn't it with with um uh reuse components is how much there's a question mark about their structural integrity because of what might have happened between you know during their life um has that become a problem that you've identified that there might be say fractures that are invisible to the naked eye or that perhaps you know the design team or the scanning people might not be able to identify themselves that then an engineer has to take on or is that just a, a little bit of an unknown that become that reveals itself at the process of cutting and then you can actually you know, or, or have yeah. you have have you have you had problems with that? Um, not really. I mean, the stone and the brick uh, have both been um, lab tested um, for their load bearing capacity by um, Web Yates or, St or, or Steve at, at Web Yates. Um, so, and, and you know, it, it, it's relatively low load. You know, it's only a uh, yeah. two story building, and uh, although the structural stone frame is load bearing and is carrying the the, the load of the roof. I mean, it, it is relatively low load, so it, it, and it actually doesn't need very much. Each of those elements I showed um, have a small um, 10 mil diameter rod uh, uh, that, that's grouted into uh, a hole that's drilled through all of the stones. So it's not post tensioned exactly. Um, it's a sort of form of reinforcement. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we, we well, <laughs> we don't think it's going to be a problem mm. um, just yet. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Hey, thank you. Um, shall we open up the um... ah? Actually, okay. So I'm just looking at the chat here. Oh, it's difficult to concentrate on two things at once. I don't know if anyone has a. It looks like there's some nice comments, but um, but no, not not any particular questions. I wonder if there's anyone there who um wants to add something. It'd be great to hear hear from you. I think Eddie's put his hand up, but I don't know, Manager. Do we have a um, policy that everything has to be typed as the questions, or can we? Let no, people... I've asked Eddie to unmute. Oh, great! Oh. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, should I open my camera or? Sure. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, hi there. I'm Eddie. <laughs> Uh, I'm currently a undergrad student at um, Central St. Martins, and I'm actually working on my current project is actually based in Portland. And so I had to, I was quite, I guess, interested in terms of when I guess I've, I've been visiting there and working with the Stone Trust. And one of the questions I had in mind was actually what are some of the ways in terms of, I guess, planning ahead so that if there's an eventuality of certain buildings, being demolished or taken away is there a process where we can sort of um what's it called almost i guess plan ahead to actually have those stones returned to its almost its original place or it, not just that but other buildings as well yeah thank you yeah thanks um let's have a thing i mean in terms of planning ahead um I mean, actually, some of the some of those granite blocks that we showed from the Thames Embankment have actually been taken back to uh, Delank Quarry, I understand, which is where they orig originally came from. So, yeah, quarries can just be used as they are. Quarries are material stores, too. I mean, the quarries, you get a lot of stone carried by the quarries, too. So that is actually not a not a bad way of doing it with stone if you take it back to the quarry, because at least you've got like for like stone and then you can recut anything you need out of either a newly quarried bit of stone or a um, or else uh, um, another another, you know, return piece. Um, so more broadly, in terms of planning, I mean, certainly what we did um, say what we did with Courthouse was to develop a, a court construction kit where the idea was that the parts themselves were fairly reasonably generic and so then could be reused and the cork house was actually very bespoke and it had loads of different block types but we've done some other projects since a pavilion in Seoul Biennale and also we're working on a, a, a warehouse project in Germany at the moment where we're trying to work with much more generic types of large block so a little bit like like bricks um in brick houses but but a much bigger thing and we, we started working together on a new uh, research project called stone construction kit 
but we're doing something quite similar with stone really so having a having kind of families of prefabricated parts that can be easily assembled on site disassembled for reuse um you know for, for just moving and reassembly or for reuse in other structures so yeah we're working on that sort of on that but it does um you need to consider it that sort of stuff at design stage to really try and maximize the, the future uh, potentials for those parts yeah, it's a, it's a good question because in, in terms of people mm. talk about circular economy mm. and they tend to focus on the on the word circular and actually the idea of the economy um is probably more important actually um you know every time you know every time you make one we made one of our court blocks say on court case was oliver says was rather bespoke um set of blocks every time we made something uh machined it you know in a way you could argue that that sort of reduced um, its its generic nature and therefore its potential for for, for reuse as it is, um, as it, as it in, in that form uh, in the in the next book. You know, so you, it's a very strong case for something like a brick, actually, yeah. <laughs> which is this very humble um, little rectangular object. Um, you know, which which I think is a really nice in, in the concept of what we we were talking about in our lecture, is that um, it's a fantastic um, component. Uh, in that if it's used with the right type of mortar and lime mortar and so on, it can be reused over and over again. Um, and it's a very, you know, it looks like a very dull thing, but actually um, in terms of the authorship of a building, it can be used to create all sorts of fantastical um, forms and spaces, you know, so that I think. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, there's two questions in the chat. And then uh, Manuel also has his hand raised. Should I ask you the questions in the chat? Um, the first one says, um, there's a kind of romanticism to the imagery of the Phoenix house, perhaps also due to the ruralism of the context. How do you see material provenance in the context of the cosmopolitan? How can material reuse be more than just facadism in many cases? Um, uh, <laughs> um, I don't think it, I don't think it necessarily has to be facade. I mean, um, we were talking, mm. I was talking recently to um Gary Elliott from Elliott Wood Engineers, who do a lot of work on reuse and the circular economy uh and, and the GLA. Um, um and they, you know, they they are they're sort of an amazing project they're working on at the moment where they're literally taking the entire office building um that was I think was designed originally by Arab. Um it's a steel frame building, uh, and they're using uh, you know, a huge percentage um, of the st structural steel um, in, in the creation of, a, of an entire new uh, office building. Um, so I think, yeah, there's potential mm. there for it. To yeah, be. yeah. I'm, I'm not sure that the history of reuse in general is a sort of facadist type history. Um, uh, it's said that the, the new St. Paul's by um, the, the current St. Paul's design actually includes a, quite a lot of the old St. Paul's ruins within it. So the um, Gothic architecture actually uses um, uses stone facings, but structurally. So Gothic vaults and things are a structural skin, basically. But to make them um, work structurally, you need to backfill with a load of masonry. And I understand that um, quite a lot of that backfill was just collected from the site, which was just the ruins of the old St. Paul's when it when it burnt down and there was quite a lot of masonry in there too so there's quite a rich history of um reuse so yeah. matthew mentioned spolia too and that's obviously yeah. reuse typically of masonry which goes back as long as architecture really um so um in some cases the the, the reuse would have been all the stuff behind the facade actually and then you would have bought in lovely new shiny things to just clad the old sort of recycled thing that you had underneath yeah but it's yeah. an interesting question and yeah there's quite a rich relationship there yeah, yeah it's yeah, interesting question. facing and and yeah reuse material because you yeah. could see how sometimes you know from the more engineering point of view how um the structure elements um would be um probably standardized and stripped back and and, and i guess the, the what we were showing was something where we were looking for a, a more if you like the word if you have a more romantic form of expression yeah um yeah yeah, so actually, no, it's quite an interesting question and, and, in terms of yeah. attention, yeah. And something interesting now on that is just that, I guess, previously, maybe until fairly recently, uh, a lot of people would have thought about, well, if you want to make things reusable, make them modular, 
because then you've got the same kit of parts like Matthew was saying with the brick and then and then you take it away and then you can find another use for it and that's there's there still is um that that argument still holds true that can work but we've really enjoyed working with uh, Thomas Parker and other colleagues on using uh, more recently developed digital tools to enable different kinds of workflows and reuse so now we can use uh, laser scanning to capture the particular geometries of uh, quite unique um, historic stones, for example, and we can bring them, you know, next thing you know, you brought them into Rhino and you're just articulating them as you would any other component, say from mm. a from a brick manufacturer's catalogue or something. So that's really opening up a, a, um, the use of architect skills for much more tailored kinds of reuses, whereas yeah. previously that is very much the sort of thing that stonemasons would have done with hands on with the stone, but uh, th that kind of ways of working weren't really readily open to architects before. No. Can I just add, add to that? Just the word cosmopolitan inevitably implies or um, ur very urban. And I think one of the issues around that is purely to do with is space and logistics. So I think both for Phoenix House, those beautiful images of having the space of the garden nearby where the stones could be laid out to be scanned and to kind of rest, to be um, considered. I mean, Eddie, you mentioned um, the Portland quarry sculpture and quarry trust and I think um, if you've been in touch with Hannah there um, she's been instrumental in coordinating with one of Audlene from DIP 18 students from last year there's a Portland facade in the city of London on Fleet Street that was being demolished as part of a new mag magistrates court and it was three buildings that were all being knocked down and consolidated on one site so the whole of the Portland facade was due to be crushed um, and the reason for that was there was no secondary market for it because it's all quite lovely <laughs> Edwardian classical, sort of not sculptural, but just, you know, architectural elements rather than the, the sort of plain unit brick components that Matt mentioned. Um, and in order to take those stone parts apart carefully would have meant palletizing, would have meant one stone at a time deconstruction on a very, very congested site in the city of London where speed and efficiency drove the project really and actually it's really because of Eric Parry who I think has been in touch with the Sculpture and Quarry Trust that they've managed to salvage one doorway which is now being reconstructed in Portland now I don't know any details about it I've just heard it through the grapevine but I think there's that a sort of will to try and save this material which has now been I'd be very interested Eddie if you've heard what's happened with this door <laughs> or what's going on there but anyway ah yeah you're saying it's 81 Fleet Street great okay so um so but again I think you know that in a way that's gone back to almost become a sort of lonely sculpture to a, to a degree. I don't think it's got another architectural use, but part of the pressure there is the fact that it's part of this, it, it's, it's very difficult and expensive to do this in a super urban site where you don't have the room to sort of lay things out around you. So I think that relationship that quarries could have potentially um, also ties into, you know, what Matt was saying about the the economy side of the circular economy, you know, who's paying for this stuff to get moved and when. Um, and, you know, that takes a lot of like will and political, you know, organization of tax codes and so on. So anyway, but um, right. Sorry, I'll get back to the, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, a really, it's a really good point, Julia. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, I think there's a sort of question of pace, isn't there there? Um, and the speed at which, you know, things have to happen in, 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 in relation to cost, obviously, uh, and moving something forward. Um, within within a, within a sort of building contract, and 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 it, and it relates to what we value, doesn't it, as a society? Whether whether that's to do with the relative cost between material and labour as it stands, or, or or even how we value material provenance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just thinking. There's a again. The I think the next message in the chat was from Eleonora. She asks what you meant by the economy of means. Do you, do yeah, you... Can you explain that? Yeah, Matthew and I talk about this quite a yeah. lot. Um, I guess a simple way to explain it is maybe that when you have uh, got a particular situation and you know where you where you want to get to, you just do that in a very direct, take a very direct path. Yeah. Um, so that there's a level of kind of efficiency and um, elegance in in the way that it's done, and you don't end up uh, mm -hmm. meandering and undertaking a lot of making a lot of noise and heat with it. 
uh, just to, just to do something straightforward. So if it could give you a very practical example, which an example I like is just when you get a loaf of bread and you cut it with a knife, you cut you cut yourself a slice, and when you cut, you're getting two faces, yeah, with one cut, yeah. So and you can, you can just bring that across to the stone industry where. Um, you know, quite often when you're cutting stones, there's a very elaborate process to just end up with a with a with a finished cut face, um, and it can involve a lot of wastage. Well, in some in some cases with traditional methods, and also if you're using a five-axis CNC mill or something like that. So um, the work we're doing on stone construction kit is trying to focus on um, using diamond wire cutting because there's a lovely economy of means to that. It's a, it's a it's an energy efficient way to cut. But again, with a diamond wire, you cut once and you can get two usable faces. Yeah, mm. and it can it, it limits you to cutting um, in raw surfaces, but that actually gives you quite a lot of geometries to play with. Mm. Yeah, so mm. it's a way to get an artifact that you want out of it. When you cut, you get two faces that you can use. And you can you can nest them in a way that means that perhaps you get no or very limited wastage as well. Yeah. Whereas, um, so that's some of the work we're doing on stone construction kit, where we're working with uh, quarries, um, Albion stones um, at the moment uh, in Portland, just to, to see what kind of stone they're taking out of the quarry, what the shape of the stone is, and how we can work with them to really get better utilization um, out of those stones with less wastage in an elegant and, and low energy way. Yeah, and and sort of yeah, any, anything where um, one can find, uh, one can extract more, also architectural character as well through through less, mm. through, through through doing less. You no, know? so with the with the following, as Oliver said, following cork house, we did the um, we did a a cork tower for the uh, Sol Biennale, and and that was um, specifically trying to um, simplify the the blocks that we developed at cork house. And we, st we actually started looking at how we could work with the blocks um, in an un unmachined format. So as they come out of the pressure cooker with this big gnarly mm -hmm. black face, they come out with uh, where all the subarines congealed on the surface. And then, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, and then how you um, make the minimum number of cuts and keep the block the most generic and still, but on the other hand, also somehow creating more character mm -hmm. to, to the court by doing less to it. Yeah. yeah. And the Phoenix house prototype we did, that's an example, which Math referred to where You've got an existing piece of stone which has got an ornate character and weathering and if you want to get a, a generic six size cut dimension stone out of it there's a lot of cutting there and you get a smaller piece of stone uh with quite a straightforward character and that's what's been done in some cases but in some cases you sort of think okay we can actually cut less and get more yeah mm -hmm. so you make less cuts and you keep some of the ornate faces and that adds a different aspect to the architectural character. So that's another example. And it, and it can also it can also apply to uh, the the process of construction. So as I've mentioned briefly, it was a, a project we're doing in Hamburg with a um, German developer who's interested in uh, uh, scaling up the um, court construction kit to make sort of um, large scale building envelopes for for live work um, spaces. Um, from what I was talking about entirely. Economy of means. <laughs> oh yeah, that. yeah. So and what was nice there was what I liked there was um <laughs> was um <laughs> what I liked there was uh it, it, we actually started talking about what's the fewest number of moves we can make and this and the fewest number of yeah. actions in order to establish um a viable building envelope in terms of uh, performance criteria for whether it's structure or or whether um you know that was a uh, that's when we're 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 applying the economy of means principle um to to a whole construction process. Yeah, great. Um, should I ask, um, I think, Manuel, who has a question? Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this, for showing us this inspiring project. Um, I'm interested in, uh, like, should we as architects, like, develop, like, new business models for it? Because, like, the building industry is maybe not that interesting to change their like business models or so is it like a part of the architects or is it just about if we make it efficiency then and that that's it or we should yeah what's what do you think about it yeah that's a great question yeah i mean i think um as as a number of 
areas where action would be good there. I mean, it's certainly worth thinking about the kind of practice that we do as architects and the services we offer and what, what our role is in, in the built environment uh, in relation to specific construction projects and more broadly. Um, because architects are involved quite broadly across construction, I think we're quite well placed to, yeah, to, 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 to um, develop expertise when we're acting as architect, but also there's certainly a need for different uh, development and uh, building constructor models to emerge that also address um, address these matters and the opportunities and challenges. Um, so it's really going to be a kind of cross industry um, evolution uh, mm -hmm. to move in the direction that we want to. And we certainly, as architects, we we found some methods that that work um, to a certain extent. And we've also found quite a few challenges where we've worked with others and they've helped helped us helped us to solve them and or where they're just still outstanding challenges. So you know, it's something the sorts of things that we're talking about in some ways it seems simple and then when we start looking it's like well that really requires change on a lot of fronts yeah so it, it, architects can help um we need new business models uh everyone across the, the the procurement change can help i mean something we really enjoy doing and we generally do on pretty much every project is to really work closely with with um people across the supply chain going but right back in relation to provenance to the mm. origin of the material uh the mm. form that it's extracted in the, the typical manufacturing processes around that to see if we can actually work work with those experts and, and those uh, resources to really change architecture and i think that's something that um it would be great to see more architects doing that it's a lot of fun there's loads of scope for to bring change there in a pretty straightforward way mm. yeah. and i think the uh yeah that, that obviously the projects we're showing are, are by and large are us um, uh, in, enjoying ourselves tackling tackling it uh, mm. as individuals, or, or at least from the point of view of individual building projects uh, at a practice scale. Obviously, um, it's really important that at the same time that people like uh, Rota um, and Odeline that, that, that um, Juliet mentioned are, are working at a more infrastructural level, or, or Elliot Wood also doing that kind of work. Um, mm. the, I think the the scale of the practice um, that, that, that we work with. Um, yeah we don't really have the opportunity to address that on an infrastructural level yeah that's true and also we don't that's not really our main interest either i don't mm. know if you noticed but we always <laughs> like to address these issues in a way that gives architecture opportunities and and gives us a chance to 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 um give unexpected outcomes because that's what keeps us interested you know so i think the infrastructural shifts are where are where the change is really going to come um, and we love dipping into that but it's not really where where our passion lies necessarily yeah yeah, yeah. oh great thanks um tom you've got a question hi um yeah thanks it's been really fascinating um uh talks and, and discussion um i just had a question i suppose about um well like you were saying with working with with industry and with craftspeople it feels like the module itself has got different demands being played placed upon it so brick is obviously to do with one hand block you know concrete block two hands with stone it tends to be craned now and I just wonder if there if you had a sense of what maybe would be an optimum scale um, to use stone because the bigger it is the fewer cuts but the more expensive it is to crane, um, yeah, I was, yeah. you know, absolutely, yeah, no, that's a really that's an interesting one, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question in relation to the sort of stuff we've been doing. So yeah, actually, yeah, that is interesting. The kind of the module. So obviously, the bricking and the concrete block are both a kind of one person job. And we something we really enjoyed about Cork House was that was the same, but because Cork's so light, they were massive. So a 13 yeah. kilo cork block is sort of meter by half a meter by about 220. So it was kind of a bit Flintstone-ish, but you could actually lift it. And that, I guess, in some ways, we've got a bit of a nasty surprise where we started uh, <laughs> taking our approach to stone because it's so heavy and so dense. And um, and I guess, and also in a way, those kind of more one person job things have, have very much been done with stone. So the, our focus around stone had been... as so far in, in relation to new systems has been in relation to yeah 
working with large blocks of stone, doing minimum cuts, and then using machinery to to maneuver those parts and and not to use sort of person power to actually do that do the lifting. Um, so and that is that's um there's there's a very clean sort of line of argument there. Cut, you know, you're cutting the least connections between these sorts of parts in these systems are, are where you often get failure. So you get less connection points to less junctions. Um, so that all makes sense. But what we have found, but that was from a position of knowing just about nothing about stone or stone masonry either. So since then, we've, we still don't know very much, but we've been learning a lot from, uh, uh, from stone industry people in the last year or two and, and maneuvering large uh, bits of stone is, Obviously, some things done in the stone industry all the time, but but when they are large and and quite delicate pieces of particular geometries, it does present a load of challenges. Yeah. So, um, and that's that's something we're still looking at, really. So, don't we have an answer at the uh, moment? We're still working through it. Yeah. To your question, and, and there's an interesting relationship, I think, between the block of stone as it comes out of the quarry. So, with Albin stone, for example, we're looking at stone that's around two meter cubes um, in, mm. in its largest format as it comes out of the quarry so you're immediately working with a certain scale of module there and then of course it's how do you get that up to the scale of a room or a or, or a building mm -hmm. uh, and that's quite because obviously there are, there is the post oh, i know it's called post or pre-tensioning mm -hmm. um of, of you know where where you know i think um um web yates uh and, and pierre from the stone measuring company so on there you know they're looking at much larger um sort of warehouse spans using stainless steel um, post tension rods in the middle mm, of that that's and yes. yeah which is which is fantastic work um in terms of replacing sort of long span steel or, or concrete reinforced concrete members um, mm. but i think we're probably more interested down at the scale of working with what we can do with the module um as it is as a, as a as probably as a, as a as a as a simple form of assembly um yeah from within yeah. the quarried yeah. block yeah yeah, exactly. So, and I guess and another way to answer the question is simply just that, yeah, I mean, stone in quarries tends to go up to about 25 tonnes, and that's just what the equipment's designed to move. And it's also about the weight that you can that you that you can transport in a container or a bit in a shipping container or lower than that. So quite a lot of the large blocks then do get shipped around the world. So that's the kind of upper limit. And the lower limit is still the kind of the brick size, really. And there's there's still a case for for using stone at that scale. And um, I know Amin Taha and Albion Stone and others are just looking at economies around actually just chopping up certain types of stone into brick sizes, so that again you can use those those uh, trade bases that we have and use it like a brick. Mm -hmm. And um, I know what they say also is you know actually a brick is cheaper. Uh, to employ than a stonemason because it's uh, I guess it's just more widespread so mm -hmm. you know and we I think I think also we um we also have a sort of um predilection if you like um mm. for 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 the kind of constraints and restrictions working with um those quarried blocks of stone to make pure compressive structures places on you you know mm. we're not we're not necessarily so interested in in being able to make 25 meter spans by putting stainless steel yeah. rods in the stone that's not that's not where our interest lies really yeah yeah you know, if you get a real architectural um expression out of working with those limitations I, yeah i was thinking about those like concrete cantilage blocks that you get um which are a kind of module um and they often come with like you know holes for a forklift or uh mm -hmm. or, a, or a hanging point at the top so there's no slinging there's no trap slings or anything like that but yeah anyway so that's, yeah and it is it a major, is. it is one of the major challenges in areas of complexity with stone that we've still got a lot to learn about is really how are you going to really mm. be able to elegant, it's economy of means again, it's just like elegantly and efficiency, efficiently just move that around and mm. and and it might be stable when it's built, but how do you assemble it without the yeah. need for huge amounts of force work and all that sort of stuff? So yeah. that's a really, yeah, it's a really interesting question and there's, mm. there's quite a lot to it. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I just wonder on that point as well, Tom, what, what, what's being compared to or what the stone might be an equivalent to? And if it's to do with, with reinforced concrete, then actually the, the sort of scale of machinery to produce that is, you know, involves concrete trucks and, you know, large, you know, steel mesh and so on. So I think that that, that wouldn't be at the scale of the hand anyway. So I think that the sense of stone being a, a, an equivalent to that um, might be a useful analogy, but I, I 
yeah anyway just as an additional because <laughs> i know sometimes there's that's part of this argument about the reusability of the modular sort of stack column rather than the complete you know reinforced concrete as used by as default in a construction scenario yeah yeah i mean um just on the uh, we, went, we went to visit um, pierre at the stonemasonry company in lincolnshire and they were doing a sort of prototype in their yard of, uh, of blocks that were liftable by and um, they're quite thin about 100 mil 150 mil thick um mm. but they were liftable by by a stonemason and then and then on that and so it was just a scaffolding set up and they were making a large pyramidal form just in courses you know so each course mm. so it effectively corbelled in on itself mm. um very clever little tongue and groove system and you know, it's really i really we, i think we both enjoy the way um that you generate um very specific um form and space um, out of those uh, mm. relatively low tech constraints those in a way. Assembly processes, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm. Right. Um, I think, it, well, I think, gosh, it's amazing. It's 2 30. I was thinking um, perhaps we should, should we conclude unless anyone has a final question? I think we might have to conclude, but there, conclude, there are yes. some um, questions that have been sent through uh, to me uh, from students, like asking very particular things. So maybe I can just email those to you, um, the three of you, and then you could get back to them. Yeah, please do. Yeah, we'd be happy to. Yeah, we'd have happy to respond. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. This is so brilliant and like so, so fascinating to learn more about um, material provenance through this lens. And uh, and I guess to the three of you for really such an exciting conversation. So hopefully it can continue in other formats going forward. No, Great. Well, thanks for having us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you yeah. No, for, thank you so much, thanks. Matt and Oliver. Thanks, I, think, I think your work's amazing and I'm really so grateful that you came and made time to come and speak to us today. So thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.